Last time, I sort of hurried over the proof that terminal objects are unique up to unique isomorphism. And so what I want to do this time is do it properly. So what we've got is T and T prime, both terminal. And what we want to show is that they are uniquely isomorphic to each other. So the first thing we do is say since T prime is terminal, we have a unique morphism from any object in the category 2T prime. In particular, we have one from T. We have a unique morphism from T to T prime, and we can call that F. But since T is terminal, T is terminal, we have one going in the opposite direction. We have a unique morphism from T prime to T, and we can call that G. And now the idea is to show that F and G are inverse to one another. So now, um, since T is terminal, we also have a unique morphism from T to T. Unique morphism from T to T, and it's the identity which means that any other morphism from T to T has to be the identity. So in particular, this composite, so in particular, the composite starts at T, go to T prime, and then go back to T, has to be the identity on T. And similarly, since T prime is terminal, There's a unique morphism from T prime to itself. We have a unique morphism T prime to itself, and that has to be the identity on T prime. And so in particular, the composite where we start at T prime, go to T via G, and then go back to T prime via F, that has to be the identity on T prime. So we've composed F and G both ways round and achieved the identity in both cases. So this exhibits an isomorphism. So we have that uh, G composed with F is the identity on T, and F composed with G is the identity on T prime. So that gives us the unique isomorphism between T and T prime. Now this is a sort of prototype proof for all the later proofs that limits and co-limits are unique up to unique isomorphism. So that's quite important. Um, now we've already seen, one thing we've already seen is that, right, we've now seen that terminal objects aren't um, unique, they're only unique up to unique isomorphism. But another thing that's true is that they don't necessarily have to exist. So we've seen terminal objects in set, in uh, group, and in top. So here's, here's a category without any terminal objects. Um, there are various ways in which you can fail to have a terminal object. For example, some, here are some non-examples. So we can have a very small category with two objects and a pair of morphisms that are not equal. So there's no terminal object here, right? Because, because neither object um, has a unique morphism from every other object to itself. So this object has two different morphisms going from here, and this object has no morphisms going from here to here. So this has no terminal object. Um, here's another way you can fail to have no terminal object. Uh, for example, you could have four objects and some arrows like that. So uh, this object, none of the objects has a morphism from all the other objects to itself. Okay. Another way in which we could fail to be terminal is you could have some kind of long string that keeps going of morphisms that just keeps going and going and going. That 
is also going to fail to have a terminal object. Um, oh, before I draw this line, another very interesting one that fails to have a terminal object is the category of fields. Um, because unless you allow for a one object field, which uh, some people sometimes do, but usually we don't allow for a one object field because we usually say that zero in the field can't be equal to one. And that means that it can't be a terminal. It can't be terminal. And this isn't a proof, right? But it's kind of, uh, the idea behind it is that if you've got at least two objects, supposing you're trying to map from some other field to there, well, you don't know whether you're going to send each object to, to zero or one. Um, and so the category of fields does not have a terminal object. And this is sort of indicative of fields being a tricky category. Uh, we'll later see that many of these categories I've just talked about are certain kinds of categories. They're monadic oversets, um, which means that they can be expressed in terms of monads. If they can be expressed in terms of monads, they can definitely, that, that means they definitely have uh, limits and in particular, they'll have terminal objects because terminal objects will turn out to be a kind of limit. So when you don't have when you don't have a terminal object, then you that that means you've failed in that sense, and you can't possibly be monadic. Now I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, so I'll stop there. And next time we'll talk about the dual notion to this, which is the notion of initial object.